Okay, well, thank you all for coming out tonight. It's really a pleasure for all of us to be able to share our recent research with you. Uh, it's uh, the point of great pride uh, to contribute to really a long tradition of this in the history program at Del Mar. So as uh, Dr. Stone mentioned, the book that I'm going to be discussing uh, just published this year, around the same time as uh, Dr. Odin's book. We're working on this uh, really in the same time frame over the last uh, several years here at Del Mar College. Uh, it's called Middle Class Union Organizing the Consuming Public in Post-World War I America. Got to remember this microphone. Um, so as you can see, it's set in the World War I era in the immediate post-World War period. Uh, and it reflects that historical moment, but also some longer term changes in American society. Uh, so the moment that we're looking at where all these middle class individuals, white collar workers, organize, proclaiming themselves the middle class and set the stage for implications that are with us here today, is on the heels of the second industrial revolution. This is the moment in the late 19th and early 20th century when American industry became the most productive and powerful in the world. And with that came the rise of a consumer society, or you could say uh, a more entrenched consumer society. And kind of tying these themes together, uh, Dr. Oden will be looking at rural and agricultural life. Uh, this is a particularly important time and transition for a lot of folks who used to uh, be part of that uh, type of life. More and more Americans are living in urban areas, suburban areas, and we see a growth in the uh, white collar workforce relative to the rest of the population during this time. So think of folks rather than producing a crop or they're you know, producing a product with their hands, now they're pushing paper around. Now they're managing the bureaucracy or money of this second industrial revolution. And over time, by the time we get to the moment that this book is set in, right after World War I primarily, uh, they define their own identities, the, who they are themselves, at, uh, more based on what they buy, what they wear, where they live, than perhaps what they do for a living. So that has implications. Now for the immediate time frame, we're talking about World War I and the post-World War period. And during that time, from about 1914 to about 1921, the on economy undergoes quite a shock. The cost of living goes way up. Uh, prices increase at times by about 80% in that period. And working class blue collar wages actually do tend to keep up with that. So make no mistake, we're talking about individuals in the mines or in the factories who are laboring under grueling conditions for very low pay. But relatively speaking, we're not seeing such a economic difference between the way that was in, say, 1910 to uh, 1921. And in that same time frame, during uh, American participation in the war, as well as uh, uh, European uh, warfare, uh, elites, their profits go way up as well, actually more than the cost of living. So you can see who might be a villain here. Um, but white collar salaries remain stagnant. So if we tie this all together, there's cause, at least in the consciousness of a number of white collar workers, to see their consumer identity under threat where they've increasingly defined themselves based on what they buy. And a key element of what I'm talking about here is that not only do we as Americans or as individuals define our own identity through consumer practices, but in particular in this time frame, white collar workers are declaring themselves the middle class on the basis of those very consumer practices. Now, I'm certainly not the first historian to say that, uh, but one of the things that this book really contributes is to explore the political ramifications of that, how white collar workers in this moment politically mobilized, and the kind of cultural values and political ideas that came with that, some of which are still with us here today. So as they see the economy changing, as they see prices going up but their salaries remaining stagnant, in the period of immense change uh, that that is World War I and the immediate post-war period, they pick on particular villains for their consumer woes. On the one hand, you have blue-collar workers who are going on strike quite a lot as some of the same, it's a larger discussion, but some of the same struggles that they had had, regardless of the cost of living, were still with them. So uh, by one estimation in 1919, about a third of the blue-collar workforce goes on strike in that year alone. And then uh, they also identify profiteering elites, 
as uh, culprits for their consumer woes. So they had jacked up the price, not just by uh, allowing for workers to go on strike, but then adding a little bit on top, making it harder for white collar workers to afford what they see as key to defining who they are, because after all, they can't really say, I'm creating this product. I'm planting that crop, harvesting that crop, so your identity has to come from somewhere. And it's not just commentary, but actual organization that this book looks at. So for instance, over there you can see a drawing of a bunch of white collar workers getting ready to garden. So they're playing farmer, literally performing the hard work of farming, digging up vacant lots, uh, digging up their backyards, front yards as part of clubs, not just as individuals, and celebrating their own producerist work ethic, that their time-honored values of hard work and thrift, even ironically as they're seeking to defend their ability to freely consume as the middle class. So they're borrowing kind of the, the values of production from farmers and the urban working class to defend their own consumer identity. And that's just one example. You see this everywhere from Boston to Los Angeles, localized uh, in settings that are at the neighborhood level. Here, this is particularly Chicago, but you also see in defense of the ability to live in a middle class neighborhood. And you know, think of what that comes uh, with. Uh, you're around neighbors that you perceive just like you, and you can fill those apartments with nice middle class furniture and all those outward expressions of your identity, they form tenants protective societies. That was a tactic used by blue collar workers before white collar workers proclaiming themselves as a middle class ever did so. It really starts uh, about two decades before this in New York City among uh, socialist residents, uh, oftentimes Jewish residents as well, than other working class residents uh, of a variety of political identifications. So they appropriate that strategy kind of like appropriating the actual performance of agricultural labor, of, of hard work, uh, before and after the office, uh, to form these exclusively middle class tenants unions that if you look at who the members are, they're white collar professions, clerks, lawyers, uh, accountants, those individuals, again, managing the bureaucracy of the second industrial revolu uh, re revolution. So uh, they uh, refuse to move out on, uh, Move out day, usually it's May 1st, May Day, quite well uh, timed, uh, if you know a little of the history of that day. And to the point where they're barricading their doors with pianos and chains, there's one great anecdote that actually begins the book where a doctor in Chicago fires a shot at a new tenant trying to come into his apartment because he doesn't want to pay higher rents. Who are the culprits here? Same kind of cast of characters, blue collar workers who allegedly had driven up the price of housing by going on strike or being corrupt in the building trades, allowing landlords then to capitalize on the uh, low supply of housing uh, despite the increasing demand in places like Chicago or Philadelphia or many other cities. And of course, the profiteering elites as well. They didn't invite blue collar workers into these organizations largely and demonize them for their supposed non-production, their supposed laziness. It was they, the consumers, as it were, that had the true producer value. So very much this is self-righteous. Um, there are a few other examples of this, but one I want to point to in particular, all these white collar workers, if you look closely, a number of them still have their white collars under there. They still have their suits maybe even under there. And they're all wearing overalls. Overalls, the clothing of productive labor, that our clothing can even be symbolic text. And that's what cultural historians would look at, things like that. And they're forming clubs all over the place, boycotting new clothing, condemning profiteers, condemning strikers in uh, the textile industry, and proclaiming themselves once again to be the middle class. They parade down the streets of Lansing, Michigan, Los Angeles. Here's New York City. This parade actually featured camels and circus elephants as well. So there's a spectacle to it. Um, but think of what this means. You have white collar workers saying that they're defending the producer values of hard work to, to bring down the cost of living, condemning profiteers for driving up the cost of, of clothing themselves, and wearing the, the, the clothing of productive labor. Now, uh, in this particular movement, workers themselves got pretty upset about it because it drove up the price of overalls. Now all these people <laughs> dressed like me are going out trying to buy overalls. 
And so one of the things that the book looks at certainly are these localized movements that are spatially significant, where you might be organizing not at the workplace, but in your neighborhood, in your apartment building that's a middle class apartment building, or in your neighborhood where the vacant lots are, demanding support from federal, state, and city governments. But there's also another concept, discursive space. So what are journalists saying about this? What are you know, movies and per, uh, creators of sheet music and other forms of cultural discourse saying about this? What about politicians right here? And some of this will be pretty hard to see, but whether you're looking at the Corpus Christi Caller and Daily Herald, the New York Times, or uh, Life Magazine, Literary Digest, before you know it, discussion of these grassroots movements is all over the place. What kind of phrasing are they using? What sort of values are associated with these kinds of grassroots movements? Well, wh one uh, thing we see is not just the intrigue, you know, students, government, etc., but tied together, no matter what the commentary is, we see this representation of this white collar upsurge in consumer activism as a proclamation that the middle class is remembering itself that these folks are not just white collar workers. They are the middle class, and even more so, they are the public. They are America. They are the backbone of this nation. That should sound kind of familiar, after all. Take your pick, any presidential election, heck, probably any city council meeting, any number of uh, books from the left to the right to somewhere in the middle there, somewhere <laughs> way on the left, somewhere way on the right. And one thing we seem to have in common here is this notion that we need to defend the middle class, defend the middle class, that the middle class is under threat and that our very nationhood is at stake. It's not the first time this has happened, even though these are recent examples of that. Maybe there's some comfort in that, that we're not going to go away if you consider yourself middle class. But really what I want to end with here, at least in this introduction, is this question, who really belongs in the middle class? Have we really defined that term? If it was white collar workers in 1919, 1920, blue collar workers did not belong in the middle class. Only particular farmers, those who were willing to sell their goods directly through a municipal market movement to white collar workers for prices that wouldn't guarantee them any kind of American standard of living, only those farmers belonged in their version of the middle class. That was a version of the middle class that was played to by politicians from presidential candidates to city council members and the results were quite tragic. Laborers, and there are some other factors that go into this, blue collar laborers enter a very difficult time for organizing and for their access to economic justice during the 1920s. This discourse played a role in that. Now what about today? When we consider President Trump or any number of other uh, commentators, even if it's not quite said who belongs in this middle class, really uh, the very idea of who has freedom, who has access to full citizenship rights in this nation could be at stake depending on the answer to that mm -hmm. question. So with that in mind, I want to turn it over to Dr. Odin uh, to talk about uh, similar questions of workplace and economic justice and, and conditions. Okay, well thanks. Right. Let's just, uh, Mark, I please go back to that original picture. Here we go. We'll start with that. That's the only thing I've got. So. All right. Yeah. <coughs> well, should I use the microphone? Yeah, I'll stand up like this. Can we all, can we all hear? Every, every, oh, that's great. But um, anyway, uh, I've got a little bit, I guess, a little bit visually less uh, complicated presentation here. But I do have the picture <laughs> of the, the, my book. Uh, <laughs> And so I'm just going to kind of use that. But I was thinking, you know, as I was, I was, as I was listening to uh, 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 Dr. Robinson's presentation and the place of the city, um, we're going to be moving to the countryside in, in this discussion. But a little bit, I thought I would just kind of start and begin talking a little bit about the title uh, of my book. And I think really in 10 minutes, um, that's really what I'll be able to, to do is to go through that title and kind of um, tell you the themes of my book and the the, some of the major themes that I hit on here. So first of all, Harvest of Hazards. Um, that book really refers, as you can imagine, to agriculture, right? So uh, I'm, my book really centers on agriculture in the Corn Belt. And hopefully you're all familiar with that term, the Corn Belt. That would be, that would include uh, the 
Iowa and eastern Nebraska, all the way east Ohio, right? And uh, my book really centers on, on that, that particular region, that, that particular place. And it really deals a lot with the, the topic of technological change and uh, this, the profound changes that were going on in the countryside, the incredible changes that were going on in the countryside and what that really means to the families that worked in those areas. And uh, uh, the, the really the big point here is that uh, it's, it was one of the most dangerous um, occupations. Uh, in, uh, it was really one of the most dangerous occupations in this period. And, um, so harvest of hazards and then uh, family farming, when we look at family farming uh, the, in, in Iowa, uh, the family, the, the individual families worked in these areas and uh, faced these tremendous technological changes with tractors and chemicals, uh, herbicides, fertilizers, and uh, faced these, uh, th these difficulties uh, on the family farm. And then in terms of uh, expertise, uh, my book really looks at engineers, uh, it looks at farm safety experts, it looks at extension agents, and it looks at the ways that these individuals approached these problems. Um, so that's really the, the, really the center of, uh, of my discussion and the, and the center of, uh, of the book. And just like, um, uh, uh, when it, just like uh, I was talking about here a little bit with, with, with this book. So, um, but yeah, that's. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and, and I'll take some questions. Can I ask you? Yes, absolutely. Um, something that struck. I've, I've read both these books. Strong <laughs> recommendation. Um, but something that, that struck me in, in yours, especially. Uh, I'm not from the country. I'm a city boy, born and bred. Um, I don't know a lot about farming. I, I know a lot about American history. I sort of have this idea of farming that I imagine I share with a lot of other Americans. That it's this beautiful pastoral, you know, the farmer with his plow and his mule and the beautiful corn growing. And what you're describing is this technological, high stakes, high, you know, industrial Absolutely. kind of experience. The, the American myth is that old kind of, you know, yeoman farmer with the plow. And I'm sort of curious where your work fits in with that mythology. Are you, are you undermining that? Are you supporting that? I think it really shows the reality of farming, and in, it shows it really shows the reality of farming in, in tremendous ways, um, because you know ex you're exactly right. I mean, there is this mythology, this agrarian myth um, in agriculture, and you know one of the things that uh, is a lot of people don't realize is if you think about it, um, and I tell my classes about this all the time, that at one point in American history, if you go back to the 19th century, 90% of Americans were directly engaged in agriculture. 90%. 90%. And today, it's less than 2%. And if, if you can imagine that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an, a phenomenal shift. And if you just look at the productive capacity of the Midwest, if you kind of look at this, uh, and you look at the, uh, talking about corn and the Corn Belt, um, in 1900, uh, farmers produce about 45 bushels of corn per acre, and today it's about 200 bushels of corn per acre. And the way that they do that is uh, with the, the introduction of these very, very potent and powerful um, technologies. Um, so in my, in my book, the first part of the book really deals with tractors and deals with anhydrous ammonia and all these herbicides and chemicals that um, really um, spark this agricultural revolution in the countryside. And I think that's, that's such a good point, Brian, because there is this, uh, I guess you could say, agrarian mythology on the one hand, and then there's this gritty, gritty reality. And you know, as I was talking to the audience out there, I was, I was seeing Teresa Klein, my colleagues, and, and Jim Klein, and I got to interview them um, for the book. And they can tell you all the dangerous uh, and hazards um, on, on the farm. And in fact, I interviewed about 15 farmers for the book. And uh, I think that was one of the most uh, riveting and I think uh, valuable parts of, of, of the research is to hear about you know, how these technologies, once they were introduced, what kind of impact that they had um, on, on the farm. Because a lot of people don't realize, and I think uh, uh, Teresa mentioned this, is, 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 is it was basically a factory in an agricultural setting. And see, we kind of miss that because we kind of have this image of agriculture as an idyllic, romantic place. But when you start mixing in and you start thinking about powerful, potent chemicals like anhydrous ammonia, or you start thinking about the introduction of electricity, and the kind of responsibility that that put on farmers, because a lot of people don't realize that the, the, the people that worked on farms were, were small kids um, and the very old. And you know, even today, if we look in agriculture, the average age of the farmer is actually going up. 
Um, I think in the 1980s, the average age was about 58, and today that average age is 67 or 68. And many farmers look at this as a way of life, and they don't want to go to, re uh, they don't want to retire. And so you kind of mix um, a family, and that's one of the things that I was trying to <laughs> communicate in the title there, but it's, it's, there's, no, there's not a separation between the workplace and the home in, in this kind of agricultural setting. So these technologies, uh, and, and in an earlier period, animals as well, um, there's no separation. So you're facing all these hazards at, at very, very young ages. And I think, uh, I remember when I intervie interviewed Jim, you know, uh, we were talking, and uh, at a very young age, uh, young people are in exposed and part of this workforce. And so it, it really exposed uh, the family to dangers that, uh, that you might find in a mine or you might find in uh, these kinds of settings uh, in, in very, very dangerous ways. And on another side of it, too, is you, you don't have the regulations. So as the very beginning, I was talking about this concept or this idea you know, that, that farming was one of the most dangerous professions. So if you look at things like commercial fishing, you look at the timber industry, farming is right in that, at that level over the last 40 or 45 years. And that's because there's this uh, difficulty in regulating it and many times uh, a resistance to regulating it. And at the same time, all these uh, potent technologies. In fact, uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons why uh, we get this massive production. So that's kind of this concept of unintended consequences, I think, runs the entire book. You know, these uh, farmers are looking at these tools and, and purchasing these tools to increase their productivity, but there's all these um, hidden and, in some cases, very powerful unintended consequences that are impacting them. Well, I, was, I was struck, too, related to that, at, at what seemed to me, and I, I was trying very hard to be open-minded and generous, people behaving in ways that just seemed reckless. Um, and I wonder what accounts for that. And you, write, you write about farmers riding around on tractors with yeah. children on their laps, you write about people stirring chemicals yeah. with their hands, you know, and it's like, how do you not know not to do that? You well, know, yeah. What do you think accounts for that kind There's of There's a lot of conversation you can have of that, and I think a lot of it is financial pressure. Uh, you know, Mark was kind of talking about this, this, this migration to the city, and part of that migration is not by choice, it's by economics. It's by the fact that it's, it's uh, you know, farming is becoming very capital, capital intensive, it takes a tremendous amount of capital to buy this equipment, to purchase more land, to farm on a larger scale. And so there's a tremendous amount of financial pressure. And I, hopefully Jim doesn't mind if I mention this, but I remember he was talking about his father, and he said the first uh, night of good sleep that his dad was able to get was when he was actually out of farming, I think. And so it's that, it's that pressure. And so uh, if you look at the farm safety specialists and the ag engineers, their priority uh, is really on, on safety, that's, that's their mission, that's, that's their kind of professional identity. Um, but for the farmer, safety was just a, one of many um, difficulties that they were, they were up against. So, that, so I think part of it's um, financial pressure, and then part of it also is um, you know, the cost of the equipment as well. I mean, when they looked at a, at a tractor, if they could buy a tractor for less money without a roll bar, uh, then they are going to, roll the roll bar is the, the protective device um, around the tractor. And so if they could buy, um, you know, a tractor without a roll bar, without a canopy, they were going to go ahead and buy that because if it, if it costs less and it costs less for their operation, they'd be willing to take um, that risk. So I think, you know, you have to look at this, this ever-present um, reality of um, pressure, the, the pressure of it, and then also a lot of times the safety information that was distributed wasn't very, uh, wasn't very accurate. Um, one of the things that farmers talked about is that the labels on chemicals were very technical. They weren't written very well. And so farmers would uh, look at it really quick and, and figure out what, what's, you know, what's basically, what do I have to do to get this out of my crop and not be um, so concerned with safety. So financial pressure is part of this. Um, and then because there's children on the farm, you know, uh, I have three children of my own and, and kids uh, are playing, they're, they're in, being kids. Uh, and they're, they're living that way in a, in a very industrialized environment. So those are, are great questions, and I hope that provides us a little bit of uh, context with what you were Thank saying. You yeah. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I did have some questions, for I think, for both of you to kind of maybe start to expand this out. I want to start with Derek because it picks up on something that you've been talking about. When, when, we, when we're looking at the sort of profession of historianship, that's a word, right? Um, <laughs> sort of what, what we did is now. Um, sort of how, how we do this work and how we... Uh, come up with these ideas. Um, where do you get information? I know, Derek, you did a lot of interviews, as you've mentioned. Uh, Mark, you showed us some newspaper things. Once you sort of have questions, I wonder what was going on with the middle class in the 1920s. Where do you start? How do you find out about something that's that remote? 
So, uh, Derek, why don't you pick uh, up where you left off? Oh, sure, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did a lot of archival research. Those are, those are a great, great questions. You know, one of, a central, uh, one of the chapters that I look at, and the reason why expertise is in the title, is that I look at this new field that was emerging in the 1920s, uh, the farm safety expert. And this uh, uh, emerges, this field emerges, this profession emerges out of a number of concerns. One of them was the farm labor problem of World War II. And so economists and other experts in the field realized that accidents, was actually, accidents were wasteful. That, that when you were fighting the war, the last thing that you wanted was thousands of people being injured and killed in farming. But uh, a lot of it was archival research. So I actually you know, went to archives, particularly Iowa State and others, and uh, looked at a lot of, uh, a lot of times an engineer or a farm safety expert would retire. And so they would, they would uh, have like 70 boxes you know, of material. Sorry for the obvious question. Yeah. I know for you. What are archives? <laughs> yeah. What do you find in those? What exactly. No, these, that's, a, that's a great question. No. Um, sp I would, special collections. Uh, and uh, many times uh, professors and uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, pr uh, professionals, uh, farm safety engineers, but in, er, even beyond that, um, individuals will donate materials to, to a special like collection. Their personal, their personal things, things, exactly. And uh, I spent a lot of time in, in, a lot of time in, in special collections. So really one of the, I really have to thank archivists uh, in that regard. They play a, a very, very important role. So I would actually go to these uh, uh, special collections, these places like uh, special collections at Iowa State or other places, and, and go through their catalogs and look at those particular collections that really related to my field. And you know, one of, uh, uh, one of them was a collection that dealt with a, a, a gentleman who'd worked in the farm safety field for 40 years and just happened to donate all of his materials to this, uh, to, to the special collections, and uh, was actually the president of one of the key organizations that worked in safety. And so that was just a treasure trove of, of resources. So you can just go into a library, they can give you all of the personal papers of these yes. historical subjects, and you can just read them. And, and so that was, that was very, very helpful. And then uh, definitely all the professional journals. Uh, and I think the challenge with that is reading specialized literature. Uh, one, one of the really ch challenges is that if you don't have an agricultural engineering background or if you don't have a chemistry background, uh, finding resources, finding experts that can help you kind of interpret that material was, was very, very challenging. But also, you know, the interviews that I conducted were, were absolutely crucial. In, uh, in giving the perspective of the farmer. So a lot of this was finding sources that could give voice to these various um, players in this, in this issue, in this, in this, in this larger, um, and larger. You're actually talking to people who experienced the Yes, but, and then you know, the farm, uh, the uh, agricultural periodicals, uh, Successful Farmer, Wallace's Farmer, so actually uh, journals and, and magazines that farmers were reading, all kinds of USDA reports. So that's, that's uh, you know, my garage at the end of it was just filled, <laughs> filled with, uh, with those kinds of, of materials. My wife can attest to the, the hard work of going through those and trying to make sure my end notes were right and my footnotes were right. And I think that's one of the explanations as to why these, these kind of works take five or ten years to do. Uh, but I, I really want to thank uh, the archivists. I think they're kind of an unsung, some of the unsung heroes in this kind of work. Because without them, there's no way that we could produce um, these kind of works because they, they um, catalog this information, they organize this information, and so I really have to thank uh, those uh, folks who are in the, in, the special, in the field of special yeah. collections. Mm -hmm. It's very, very important. So. Mark, did you take the same question? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. That may not even be turned on. But oh, okay. <laughs> uh, does it, yeah. does this make a difference? Good, okay. Good. It, oh, it does. What do you know? Um, so very similar to what uh, Dr. Odin was talking about, uh, but it was a little bit different for me. Uh, so I'm searching mainly for these grassroots movements. Where were they most prominent? Uh, where am I likely to find materials on them? Because, uh, and this is very similar to a lot of what Derek was saying, because they're everyday people, there's not necessarily any kind of guarantee that there are any papers. And unfortunately, when I'm studying something like the years 1919, 1920, 1921, and I'm starting this around 2005, oral history is just out of the window. So I can't interview anybody except the uh, occasional failed attempt. Did your dad ever talk about anything like this? Pass that <laughs> on, and that didn't really work for me. For some other uh, topics, that, that would work. Uh, so for me, I really did start with what was most available. I kind of started uh, with the popular periodicals, the newspapers that were available to me in Providence, Rhode Island. This was also just when digital uh, newspapers mm -hmm. were getting started, so I did a lot of microfilm.
but I could digitally search the New York Times and uh, search for something like uh, tenant activism or overalls in these years and at least gain a sense of where are the epicenters of the movements that I'm tracing. And that doesn't really answer, okay, what then? Because I can't just rely on newspapers. One of the problems with that is you're getting this sort of public face of this, mm -hmm. not the internal thoughts or even just thoughts with less of a wide-ranging audience of the people who are trying to organize <laughs> some of the problems with sources. But from those widely available sources uh, that are national periodicals that ultimately I tie back to in the end to describe this sort of uh, discursive space of um, middle class consumer victimhood, of, of uh, the middle class being the public, the nation, all of that, uh, that becomes critical. But not, it doesn't really help me that much with other than mining quotes that were said to reporters of, of the local movements. So I had to get a little bit creative. I drove around the country. I was fortunate to go to a graduate program that would pay me to do that, a very little. Uh, so a lot of <laughs> campgrounds and ramen noodles and things like that. <laughs> I have some more colorful stories about that, but it's probably not uh, right for the public audience. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> people you meet. Anyway, uh, so, uh, but, but, but that gives you a little bit of intrigue and mystery. But you move around the, the country, try to chase these movements, and then even something like court records. If I'm studying tenant activism, yeah. and I decide I'm going to focus on Chicago. Well, what about those old cases where these landlords are saying, what, you won't move out? You know, even when I take the back door off of your apartment in May, and it's cold, you still won't move out? Uh, I'm going to take you to court. Well, that was kind of the point. So then the municipal court is flooded with forcible detainer cases. The legislator has to act in favor of tenants and all these kinds of things. Well, maybe I can read into the thoughts and attitudes in the courtroom through, if I got lucky, some of the uh, records that remain. So there were a lot of those kinds of things where I had to not necessarily look at the collection of this great you know, tenant activist leader or the leader of the overall movement uh, in where it started in Jacksonville, Florida. But instead, OK, where is this talked about in, in other kinds of uh, sources that maybe weren't created mm -hmm. for that purpose? Uh, so it was a lot of chasing that kind of thing down and then bringing it back to the national discussion that would be in Life magazine. And that's right on the shelves of the library where mm -hmm. I went to grad school, or if not, interlibrary loan. So, um, so that was basically the, the, the process of the primary research. I do want to add one thing real quick. Uh, none of this really has quite as much relevance or presence if we don't relate it back to uh, the literature of what other historians uh, have written. Yeah. So for instance, with Derek's book, uh, not too many people have really talked much at all about the issue of farm safety. They've talked about agriculture. They've talked about safety for consumers consuming these products. But he was able to fit that within a niche, you know, where, oh, this really helps us understand something more about than what was already written. And in, in my case, uh, I was hopefully able to do that as well, where the middle class had been talked about more as, mm -hmm. in its pro-labor threads and in its um, a kind of at the cultural level, but not necessarily at the cultural and political level for its own defense in that mm -hmm. era. Uh, uh, sort of follow up to that. You, you mentioned the, the trying to find a niche. Uh, oh. Obviously important. You both did that, and it's something that's actually, I think, very interesting about your books, and something that certainly people who, who maybe don't read a lot of history books of this kind might be surprised by. And that is that you're both focusing on very specific, mm -hmm. pretty narrow topics in a lot of depth and a lot of detail. But I mean, Mark, you're looking at you know, middle mm -hmm. class unionization, organization in a few cities in what, about a two year, three year period? Mm -hmm. And Derek, you're looking at just a few states, just farmers, mm -hmm. just the issue of safety mm -hmm. over about a 30 year period. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, if, for people maybe who are interested in American history in general, oh, you know, like yeah. the students we teach all the time, yes. how do you fit these little, tiny, oh. you know, specific topics into some kind of bigger themes? I mean, are, are they, or are they just disconnected and separate from those people? Oh, yeah, that's that's a great question, Brian, and and I think uh, that's a really good question. And you know, it's it's really you know, uh, it's all around us, you know, because uh, you know I think of just our occupational specialties that we have today, and part of that's because of our the massive productivity of agriculture. 
And uh, I think I was just talking to, to Renato a little bit before the presentation, and I'm the first generation off the farm. And, uh, you know, I think that's symbolic of so many people in the United States today. Even in Iowa, I worked at a, at a living history museum. This is where you dress up in the farm costumes, you know, and the hats and all that. <laughs> Who were you? I, I, was, I worked on the 1900 farm, so I had the overalls that we were yeah, talking about you earlier, <laughs> you know, and everything. Exactly. And, um, but the, 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 I think it, it really hits home is this was the lifestyle for centuries, a rural, agrarian, agricultural lifestyle. And uh, I think, uh, you know, ultimately I don't want to celebrate that too much because I deal with some of the unintended consequences of this, what it did to people's bodies, you know. But um, also there's a side of it that all the nitrogen that we put in the soil, you know, that eventually ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. And actually, you know, we talk about, you know, the dead zone or the, the fact that all these fertilizers end up in the water and the kind of effects that that has on ecology. So what happens in Iowa doesn't stay in Iowa in a sense. It, it, it has large ramifications. And, you know, 40% um, you know, of, uh, of, or a large percentage of the corn that we use goes into ethanol. So, you know, or it, we think about the foods that we eat and the, the issue of corn syrup in our foods and so forth. So the, the book, even though it just deals uh, with safety, you know, it's part of this wider you know, exodus from rural areas to the city. You know, one of the things that I talk about in my class a lot is, is the Great Migration, African Americans moving up f uh, from the South to many northern cities. And, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, the, what I talk about in this book is, I think, relevant to the South, you know, because mechanization, um, chemicals, all these sorts of things mean that fewer and fewer, fewer people have to uh, work on the land and more and more people are moving to the cities. So these kinds of works in agriculture, even though um, they, they seem remote, uh, they have profound uh, consequences. And I think even the disconnection from our food. You know, um, I talk about that a lot. And the delocalization of our food. You know, it's, it's miraculous that you can go into an HEB today and just see all the varieties of food. Um, but that is so unusual and almost strange if we thought about it from a much earlier period where people would eat close and eat more local. But part of that is because of these uh, very intricate and complicated transportation systems and the technologies that really come into play in the 1940s and the 1970s. You know, I was, I was talking to someone earlier today um, you know, about my grandfather, and he actually farmed with horses. Uh, and so, you know, and here in Texas, you know, the, the changes that happened with um, the cotton picker and so forth. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I, I would definitely work on the accident end of this and how it affected the working conditions on the farm but definitely the ways in which this impacted um, migration and movement towards people and our food supply, those are, those are really relevant issues. I mean, every time that you sit down at the table or every time you go into a restaurant, even though we're not directly connected to it, it has real relevance. And um, yeah, thank, thanks for that question. Yeah. Sure, um, I'll sort of spend a, a minute or so here talking about the process itself and then a little bit more about my particular work. Uh, but when you think of the grand narrative of American history, say if you take uh, uh, one of the classes we teach, U.S. History II, the Civil War, since the Civil War, you might wonder, okay, where does that come from? These books are part of the building blocks, I mean, among many thousands, of course, that make up that grand sort of narrative. Uh, so if those books are being accurate, responsible, those ones that are our survey textbooks, they're drawing on and synthesizing all the works on particular topics. And then, of course, those writing these books on particular topics, whether it's the ones that we have or, or, or the others in our department and elsewhere, uh, they're looking at very detailed, often very local accounts. If we were just to say, I'm going to redefine the grand narrative of American history, how are you going to do that accurately and, and appreciate the nuances and diversity of our history and, and people who are living here, unless it is part of a really multi-layered process. So that's what these books contribute. That's why it's very important, I think, not just to say, let, I'm gonna write the next grand narrative of even the 50s or, or the 40s, but a particular aspect of it. So uh, in that sense, it's, it's very much relevant and it's upon those writing those sort of final textbooks that give us our, our sense of our general history to do a good job of synthesizing the most recent work that is out there. Now as it relates to my own, own work, uh, you do want to be suggestive as to why it matters. It's not just good enough to say these three years nobody's looked at this. Um, and, and I tried to do that a little bit here at the end as I was introducing my topic, that uh, as we have these grassroots organizing uh, efforts among white collar workers, 
proclaiming themselves to be the nation's middle class, amidst all of this change, they establish, along with the journalists writing about them, the uh, movie actors even portraying some of these themes in the silent films, and sheet music writers, and of course the politicians playing to them this notion that the middle class is the backbone of the nation, that it is the public, so much so that these kinds of terms are interchangeable almost today. So it doesn't mean that their definition of that prevailed until this present day, but they kind of set the stage, and, and you know, there are a few other threads going on here, but they kind of set the stage for these sort of categorizations to be fixtures for American history since then. And look no further than our current political debates to see the consequences of that. So it, it is the hope that each of our works has that direct relevance, even if it's a narrow time frame or topic, but also that uh, role in the synthesis of the broader narrative of American history. Mm -hmm. Do you think that readers would find your books useful who are not specialists in your particular areas? Are these of interest to a broader mm -hmm. audience? I hope so. Um, uh, <laughs> that's a good now, question. Now, to, to be honest, uh, that's one of the ways in which your books are judged by publishers. Um, it's not good enough just to say, hey, nobody's written about that. Maybe we can con a couple libraries into buying it. <laughs> you know, and that might be the reality. I, I don't know. But they, they will ask, literally, of the reviewers of these books, do you see a wider audience here, even if it's just, would you maybe assign this to an undergraduate class uh, if it's on... Yeah. agricultural history or cultural history or would there be people who are maybe interested in the history of American politics in the middle class or who are interested in even whether it's not specifically farm safety but the disjuncture between um, in the agrarian myth of that you know uh, mm -hmm. imagined farmer versus the real difficult circumstances that those individuals might be interested in reading directly the, these works. I know I have been in the past. Uh, granted, I'm an historian, so maybe that doesn't count, but uh, I'll let you. Yeah, you know, when I, when I think of what the public would, would be most interested in is just those, those days that I spent interviewing families around uh, coffee tables with coffee and talking to those uh, uh, families. Uh, the first couple chapters of the book really come alive with their comments, and I think um, especially uh, um, individuals with that kind of uh, rural background, individuals that have um, those kinds of backgrounds in their, in their heritage, I think would find these, uh, the, especially the first chapters, uh, you know, relevant um, to, the, to their experiences. But, but, you know, it, it, was, it is very challenging. It's, it's, it's a difficult thing because, you know, you, you do have the d demands of fitting your work within the larger l historical literature. That's, that's very difficult. And then also, um, you know, finding that original story as well. So th those are di different difficult balancing acts that you try to achieve. So. Um, okay, I'd, li I'd like with another question maybe to try to bring this to b back home to us a little bit, to this part of the country. You, uh, neither of you wrote about South Texas or, or Texas really at all, I, I believe. Um, but you write about subjects that are clearly relevant to us here that are part of life in this part of the country, in this part of the world. And I wonder if you could maybe help us connect a little bit. You know, what does your research tell us about, about us, about this community and this world? Sure, I, I, yeah. I can start. Um, the approach I took in the book, uh, though it tended to focus on just a few cities, it also focused on a broader cultural discussion and all these publications. Uh, that would have been read and relevant everywhere. Mm. But there were a few examples from Texas, not that many, but for instance, I have an image uh, that was published in the Caller and Daily Herald, the Corpus Christi paper uh, here at the time, of you know you have Lady Justice there, and then you have labor, and then you have profiteers, and it's sort of a scale, and the middle class is in the middle. And <laughs> to be defended. So um, kind of discussion here in Corpus Christi, and that uh, by definition will at least have some impact on power relationships here, how people are identifying, or at least what newspaper uh, cartoonists think uh, would uh, resonate with folks. There was an overall club here. Uh, I don't know how big it was. There wasn't a ton of commentary on it, but there is a fair amount of commentary of other places, and this happening elsewhere here. Uh, so there's that direct relevance, but you know, thematically, um, the theme of class and culture is, is, is relevant to this uh, locality. Who is considered 
part of the heart of the nation. And if you're considering especially the first two decades of uh, South Texas uh, history in the 20th century, there are all kinds of struggles as to who belongs here. And you know, middle class politics can be kind of um, another way of having that conversation that's the same conversation. You know, uh, one thing that, that I get to a lot in my book is the question of whiteness and, and immigration. Uh, that really these white collar workers define their organizations as both white and white collar and did not open these organizations to those who are seen as outside of those boundaries of their version of the middle class and really played to a lot of the racism of that time, something we can expand on perhaps a little later. Um, but considering the uh, presence of immigration, especially from Mexico at that time, uh, Mexican Americans were one of those groups that was targeted by white, white collar workers as oftentimes not part of their version of the middle class. So that's re definitely relevant to South Texas, even though uh, admittedly uh, when I wrote the book I was talking a little bit more about Southern California in those examples. Um, yeah, that's, those are great points. I was, when you were making those comments and I was, I was talking about the first portion of the book, I think the latter portions of the book are probably more relevant for a wider audience because I deal a lot with the USDA and a lot of the, you know, the extension service and uh, land grant colleges and also a lot of uh, national policies uh, and uh, regulatory agencies. So I think in terms of a national audience and even um, Texas, uh, looking at um, the whole story of why agriculture was one of the least regulated industries and why it was kind of an exception in terms of if we look at um, you know, factories or if we looked at mining and even if we looked at the railroad industry, why farming proves to be so difficult to regulate and why there is that resistance. I definitely think that would be you know, relatable um, to Texas and also um, just like my home state of Iowa, Texas is an incredibly important state. Uh, agriculturally and it's incredibly diverse. I mean you go to the valley and you have uh, the tradition of fruits and vegetables and, and, and um, you know that kind of agriculture regime and then in the north you have uh, the stockyards and the cattle industry and, and, the, and um, so it's a tremendously diverse agricultural state and in fact I don't have enough, I haven't done enough research down here to really um, uh, you know I think support these uh, points but one thing that I noticed is that a lot of the farm safety specialists were in the Midwest so when I was writing, I, it's very interesting, in one of the chapters I noticed, you know, a lot of the leaders in farm safety were all a lot of the land-grant colleges in the Midwest, and I noticed that there were a lot of safety experts at a lot of the meetings from the Midwest and from the East, but I didn't know so many, didn't find so many from the Deep South. Uh, and then also, you know, when I was just uh, uh, looking at the chemical uh, chapter, um, I, I did some reading where because of of the, the climate that we have down here, the insect pressure would be higher. And so in some cases, you'd have to use more pesticides. So it'd be, I think, absolutely, uh, you know, the, 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 I think uh, folks uh, from Texas, uh, and there were a lot, uh, um, I think, you know, Renato, we've talked about agriculture a lot over the years. And uh, uh, it definitely would connect um, to, to, this, to this region. When I mentioned at the very beginning, I was trying to talk about family farming. You know, the, the issue in the Midwest is, a lot of these operations are family owned. So we're talking about smaller acreages. And uh, you know, in places where you have very large acreages and more of an employee relationship and it isn't um, necessarily family members who are, are represent um, the workforce, it's, it's definitely a, a different dynamic. Uh, and uh, you know, if you look at the United Farm Workers, they were, trying, they were fighting for improvements in these conditions, whether it would be you know, pesticides, um, you know, uh, access to clean drinking water and all these things. So uh, even though I focus on the Midwest, there's a lot of themes that echo in these other regions as well. And uh, there, there, is, there has been uh, some work done in those areas, but, but definitely not enough, you know. Um, and so uh, there's, there's a lot of projects there, you know, left to, left to be done. And I think it's important because, um, you know, behind the food are there's people, you know, uh, and behind uh, the food is also our environment, you know, and so I think those are important things when we consider when we consume food and we can and we, we, we go to the shopping, uh, we shop for food and so forth, that these aren't, uh, that's kind of dislocated. The food doesn't have, uh, you don't see the worker behind the food, you don't see the place that it comes from um, and so forth, but absolutely, uh, I think folks that would read this in Texas would see a lot, a lot of, a lot of similarities. It's just a different type of farming in a lot of regions of Texas, you yeah. know. I think insect pressure is a big <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've heard that before, but I've yeah. seen reasons that make that yeah. happen. Um, uh, one more question from me, and then I, I do want to send it to the audience. 
Uh, one of our co-sponsors is Mexican American Studies Program. Even though you both kind of touched on this, I want to at least focus on it and give you a chance to really address it. Uh, both of you, in both of your books, you're basically writing about white people, right, in some form or another. They're really the major, just Anglo-Americans are really the major focus in both of your works. But the things you find certainly have relevance for other ethnic, ethnic uh. groups. They, they reflect on what other Mexican-Americans or any other American ethnic yeah. Um, and how they similarly organize or work mm -hmm. or whatever. And I wonder if you can maybe comment on overlap between what you found and issues related to Mexican Americans in particular or other ethnic groups. That's, that's a great point, yeah. Sure, um, I can definitely do that. Um, so the organizers uh, in the book, those who are forming the organizations that are the primary subject matter they, by the unfortunate nature of their historical perspectives, were very much white Anglo-Americans. The book itself is not just about them, it's also about the consequences of the organizing strategies that they chose and how they were talked about and also some of the voices of the groups that were affected that were not in the boundaries of their definition of the middle class or within the organizations that they specifically found. And uh, the consequences can be pretty significant, at least in this moment, this, this history playing a role in some of the broader trends of American history at that time. So for instance, I had mentioned a little earlier, uh, the 1920s, not such a good decade for labor organizing in many respects. Uh, part of that is because, well, a number of things, but one is uh, the ability to play to middle class, <coughs> white middle class anti-labor sentiment and that was very much an ethnic equation as well. Uh, when workers were, blue collar workers were targeted uh, and even by federal law uh, for violating, for instance, the Lever Food Control Act, which um, banned profiteering of food. World War I, they tried to enforce that in the post-war period and they arrested labor union leaders, including uh, even just uh, everyday workers uh, for going on strike in the railroad industry and therefore driving up prices, therefore hoarding food. So it's, it's a bit loose, but some of the testimony you see is these workers are not named Jake and Pete instead, and then there's in a time frame of, a, for instance, a lot of Italian immigration to this country, uh, anti-Italian sentiment. Even the visual portrayals in cultural history were also kind of reading between the lines of, of, of visual portrayals when you see political cartoons of profiteers, they both could be oftentimes portrayed as fat white millionaires uh, with cigars and top hats and everything, but oftentimes with very ethnic characteristics, anti-Semitic uh, characteristics, Mexican-American characteristics, uh, stereotypical African-American char characteristics. And yet when the victims were always portrayed, the middle cl class victims, they were white and they were, you know, white collar. So you have that, and then sometimes, uh, actually often, very specific racist appeals to the organizers and participants themselves. To give you one of the more um, offensive examples of this, but that is definitely worthy of investigation, uh, when you saw the, maybe the previous image of the tenant organizers going to Springfield to convince the state legislator to pass legislation that's more friendly to middle class tenants. When they got to Springfield, they held a parade. And in that parade, they had at the very back, they hired an African American individual who I imagine really needed work. And they put a sign on him that said rent hog and literally put a leash around him and dragged him there. And the idea here is if we read into that, they're literally dehumanizing the person that they had hired to do that. But they're also trying to symbolically de dehumanize their landlords by equating them in the era of Jim Crow, the era of segregation, denial of voting rights, of uh, widespread lynching, uh, things like that, saying, we are wielding power over you now. That's the way that I read into that. So even though uh, a lot of the historical actors that are the focus of the title, and including trying to form literally a middle class union, by the way, I didn't mention that before, uh, that would tie together these organizations. They're doing so playing to this discursive space of not just middle class identity, but white middle class identity.
briefly the consequences, not just for the labor movement, but one thing I want to investigate a little bit more. In 1924, we get the National Origins Act that uh, closes the door virtually on immigration to this country from primarily southern and eastern Europe and a number of other places that were places that were deemed not white. And you know, one of, for instance, the advocates of that law, Senator Elson Duran Smith, he had equated different immigrant groups, ethnic groups, to different breeds of dog. So that gives you an idea of the tragedy of that act. Well, how much does this reflect that or play into that when you, when you see people's consumer identity is tied to their class identity, is tied to their American identity, so very much predicated on the ugly face of racism in this period. Uh, there are other things going on that lead to that legislation, but I think this is something that does have an impact on those decisions that affect people's lives. Um, so, so in that sense, I think it, it, it's, it's very relevant to the kinds of questions that are uh, om really best uh, examined in fields like Mexican-American studies and uh, a number of others as well. Yeah, I, I think uh, one thing that I was thinking about as, as uh, um, Mark was talking about this, I think if you look at uh, the, the degree at which agriculture had, has and still to a certain degree in comparison to, to many industries is, has, has um, a less regulation, um, a lot of the people that are hurt by that are, you know, if we think about uh, a lot of immigrants who are doing agricultural work. I just recently read a book about um, uh, agricultural labor in Canada. And a lot of, of folks that are working in those regions are immigrating from, from Mexico and from um, Central America. And so they're exposed to this lack of, uh, of regulation in very, very, very severe ways. And I remember in my book at one point I was talking about some, some agricultural workers um, from, I, I believe, Puerto Rico. And, and the thing was, was the difficulty in reading the label. If, if the label's in English and you're fluent in Spanish, how do you, uh, you know, deal with, with that issue when it already the label is very, very challenging to read uh, already? And uh, you know, there's, I think, it, there's, this, uh, there's this issue, I think, with the consumer of inexpensive food. You know, we were, I remember when I was reading uh, Mark's book, this idea about the middle class being very upset when food prices were high. So there is this pressure to keep food prices very low. And, and, and when we look at that, we have this environment that's very unregulated in many ways. And the people that, that pay a, a tremendous price for, the, for that environment oftentimes are folks who are, who are, who are very vulnerable. You know, if you look at Iowa, for example, in the meatpacking industry, it's a lot of uh, immigrants from you know, Mexico and places like that. And so in that situation, people would be afraid to complain uh, if the conditions are very, very, uh, very difficult and, 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 and so forth. So um, when you look at the, and part of the reason why it is uh, that we see this uh, lack of regulation or less regulation is the is the very the kind of mythology we were talking about at the very beginning, the idea of the uh, and the idea of entrepreneur. And so even in situations where um, that doesn't hold up, you know, and you have an employee, uh, there, there's a resistance to regulation because of that kind of um, that that sort of agrarian attitude towards agriculture, that kind of that, that image of agriculture and the culture. And that affects all the various groups that are involved it, in agriculture. Exactly. So, uh, you know, definitely, I'm, I'm sure if you cast your direction towards Texas in the 40s and the 50s, uh, you would see a similar situation in terms of just this, the, the horrendous accidents that are happening and the impact that it, ha that it had. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Appreciate it very much. The conversation. Thank well, you. Thank you. <laughs> We would love to then take questions from you guys. If you have anything, please uh, go ahead. Um, uh, I uh, teach Zin's People's History and Mother Jesus class, English Air Do, and I'm always just dumbfounded that we still don't teach labor history K-12 basically at all. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could talk about why you think that is. <laughs> I'm happy to take <laughs> yeah. that on. Labor historian. Um, <laughs> The Texas State Board of Education. <laughs> That's the short answer. Um, uh, but more broadly, these are difficult questions of economic justice. Uh, and people, I think, a lot of times want to see history as something that's just a grand march toward greater progress. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. A lot of times things that are, are, are things to celebrate happen simultaneously with terrible acts of injustice. Um, you know, even in my own uh, work, I can 
at times sympathize with the subjects uh, uh, that I'm primarily looking at and, and, and what they're trying to do in many other cases, it disgusts me. You know, so uh, in that sense, I think the easier path for people is just to talk about the good stuff. And if you're going to uh, teach the labor movement, it means you have to talk about injustice, but then also courageous people coming together to fight for justice. And there's where you have more of the, uh, I guess you could say glass is half full uh, aspect of it. But much of this is very politically motivated, if you ask me. I mean, uh, uh, to have that conversation is to acknowledge that there isn't this sor sort of perfect uh, exceptional narrative, but one that's filled with all the complicating factors that we see in the world around us today, but in different historical contexts. So um, I think uh, we would be better off if we taught more labor history, but I might be a little biased because my field of training is labor history. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, ju yeah, just the, well, like credit, you mean like taking out loans and stuff for right, equipment? Because I need to produce, I need to get a bigger mm -hmm. tractor. Oh, abso absolutely. You know, the fin the, these financial pressures come up over and over again. And uh, they come up in really interesting ways. What we see is as farming gets l uh, larger and larger and the scale of farming gets larger and larger, it means that you have to take out more loans in many cases for your operation. It becomes more capital intensive. So the equipment becomes incredibly expensive. And you know, t today you have to buy the seeds. So if you kind of think about Monsanto and a lot of the agribusiness, you have to buy the seeds as well. Um, in an earlier period, when I, you know, if you think about uh, kind of a more organic model of agriculture, you know, it's, it's basically the calorie, the power of the calorie, because you, know, you feed oats to horses and so forth, and, that's, and it's kind of a, a more of a contained system. But you have all these outside inputs. And so you're absolutely right. And one of the things that I noticed in the book was probably one of the biggest symbols of this financial pressure, pressure when we're talking about credit, is that a lot of times, a lot of the farmers that I talked to would be holding a job, another job, and also farming. So for example, a gentleman that uh, worked, he worked at Anderson Erickson Dairy in a town, he had to drive to work and work there during the day, and then he would farm in the morning at night and also on the weekends. And one of the stories that really was very powerful is that when you're tired and you're not getting a lot of sleep and having three kids, <laughs> I think Mark can attest to this as well, just by the lack of sleep that you get, but when you have children, but in the, this case, it was the work, you know, just the constant grinding work to survive. And he really viewed this land as something more than an economic entity. It was connected to his family and did not want to lose it because it was part of this legacy. Uh, but that was when act one, at one night after working, working and working, working and working tremendous long hours, uh, this, uh, this corn picker was mounted. It was kind of a side-mounted corn picker. And uh, he actually got uh, his hand caught in part of the corn picker, but he was able to drive the tractor back to the barn. It tells you a couple, two things about farmers in the period. As more and more people are moving off the land and you're farming larger acreages, a lot of times you're isolated, you're by yourself. So when you do get hurt, you're far, you're far away from emergency services, you're far away from help, and a lot of times people will die in pretty gruesome ways out there in a field by themselves and so forth. But he made it back, and, and one of the, the, I think the meanings that I drew from that story was the fatigue factor. And the fatigue factor is back to your question with banking and credit, uh, and back even to the point that I was making with Jim's father earlier, is that pressure, uh, whether it's credit, owing money to the bank, uh, owing money <laughs> because you have to buy this equipment, or sometimes feeling like you have to owe money to expand your operation. Uh, so you're just trying to constantly work up, uh, work to keep up with this ever-increasing scale. And so, and then also it kind of fits back to what we were talking about when we were talking about Texas and, and, and relating this to, uh, you know, Mexican Americans and others. I mean, the, the government policies are going to are obviously favoring the larger farmer. So if we look at the USDA and the Agricultural Adjustment Act, and we go back to the 30s. It's not the tenant farmers or your renters that are going to benefit from these programs. It's your larger operator. That's just the reality. I'm not trying to make moral judgments here. I'm just saying that's the reality. So if you're the small family farmer, you owe 80 acres. Or if you're a tenant or if you're a sharecropper, that's why they're migrating. Those policies are benefiting folks who own the land already. So in his case, he's working himself into exhaustion to hold that 80 acres and holding that second job. And so I hope that kind of answers your question. But it relates to accidents because you're exhausted, you're tired. And a lot of the, the, the stories that I read, a lot of the people that um, I interviewed uh, said that some of the, the, 
the closest calls happened um, at that at that point of uh, exhaustion, and it relates to credit because of the pressure. It's that it's that constant grinding pressure. Yeah, it's a great question. Oh, so, um, oh, I'm sorry. That's fine. I, I had a question for Dr. Robbins. Okay, so this is in the immediate aftermath of the first Red Scare, in 1919, etc. Um, in your research. Did you find any evidence that these um, overall groups, et cetera, attracted the attention of the Federal Bureau of Investigation at all, or any kind of organized law enforcement, or did they not take them serious? Um, that's, that's an interesting question. So some of these movements are taking shape during the Red Scare. Technically, all of them are, although there's, you know, you could say upsurges and, and this very much sort of anti-radical fervor. So. Uh, what, what, what he's referring to is this moment in 1919 and 1920 when you just have like you know you have professors getting fired for mm -hmm. alleged socialist ties. The teachers uh, were fired in New York City because their kids knew what socialism was. I'm not making that up. Um, you know you have uh, Attorney General Mitchell Palmer, A. Mitchell Palmer, mm -hmm. rounding up uh, laborers uh, whether or not they really were radical despite the First Amendment and holding them without really due process of law. So this, uh, this is a big context, and it's right after World War I, 1919, 1920. Um, this is you know, another one of those things that makes uh, it difficult for laborers, uh, blue collar workers going on strike during that time is because they're branded reds, they're br branded radicals. So then what about white collar workers when they're striking at this, the site of consumption? or through their consumer practices, you have that language thrown around. Um, you have the, the notion that this is disorder, and, and what are they doing, but who's really saying that? A lot of the kind of uh, clothing manufacturers, for instance, uh, for the overall movement. But by and large, most of the anti-radical hatred is directed toward the working class. So if anything, it helps the cause, tragically so, of these white collar organizers because they can not only say, look, those textile workers, they're lazy, they're non-producing, they want exorbitant wages, they're going on strike, and they're reds too, they're radical, you know, and, and, and you know, at times, like the tenant uh, organizing, there's this back and forth that, oh yeah, you're saying I'm not 100% American, I'm 110% American, and then, you know, you see this literally uh, debated in the Illinois state legislature, you know, who can flex their I'm more American muscle and who is more Bolshevik than the next person. Uh, so yes, they are, ac they are uh, accused of that, but it doesn't stick nearly as much as it does against the working class. Um, but, but it's a very important context because it's, it's such versatile language. Uh, there, are, there are books about the Red Scare that relate this language to how we think about the family at that time, to how we think about gender, how, how that can aid and abet Jim Crow in the North and in the South. Uh, so that anti-radical language is also very powerful, much like the language of class and middle class to give or deny people opportunities mm -hmm. and rights. It's a good question. Go ahead. I didn't mean to get no, no, it's okay. Um, what are the biggest challenges that modern farmers are facing currently? You know, I, I think a lot of it continues. You know, at the very end of my book, uh, I've got, I, talk, I have an epilogue, you know, and, and, I, and really you see a lot of, of similar themes. Um, I think there's this continual, continual adaptation to new technologies. Um, and, uh, you know, I was just reading an article where uh, one farmer, I think, in Kansas, uh, his operation was 30,000 acres, I believe. So uh, you know there there are there are folks who are who are um, you know smart uh, finding more niche markets smaller markets you know and going to farmers markets and so forth and 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 uh, growing in more specialized ways uh, and having smaller operations but definitely uh, you see a similar kind of um, uh, trend towards large operations I think the constant challenge of adapting to new technologies. And that's, that's one of the big you know, themes at the beginning is you know, adapt, going from horses, right? Uh, farming with horses, which was a whole different thing, a whole different reality. Um, and uh, you, you, you'll, read that, you'll read that in the, in the book, uh, that you know, farmers, rest, I mean, horses have to rest. You have to, you have to rest them in the heat, right? And so the whole pace of farming changes, right? Because you have to rest the horses, you have to take them in from the heat. But these machines never stop. They're relentless. And uh, 
it's interesting. Uh, I, I think about World War II when I think about that because there was this emphasis on, on production. And one of the farmers that uh, uh, I interviewed talked about that, that there was such an emphasis on, on production that this, this gentleman was running this corn picker all the time and going to different farms and basically hiring, hiring himself out. And that contributes to, to the accidents as well. So I think, you know, even with today, it's, it's genetically modified crops, it's drones. Uh, you know, it's, it's crop mapping, it's tractors that essentially can drive themselves with GPS systems and so forth. So um, there's a tremendous uh, technological, uh, you know, learning curve that you have to uh, continue. And also, back to, back to the earlier point, expense. It's tremendously expensive. And then that doesn't even account with the, the increase in land prices. Uh, I was talking to an individual, I was actually reading an article not too long ago about, I think an acre of farmland in Iowa recently, this was a couple years ago, was about 7,000 acres. Uh, $7,000, I should say. So an acre of $7,000. So just the capital it requires. And, and uh, it reminds me of a conversation I had with, with coffee. And, and by the way, you know, coffee is very important when writing a history <laughs> book. We were talking about food. We were talking about things. And, and caffeine probably wrote half the book, I would say. but, but uh, you know, uh, I, I was talking to him, and he said that uh, you know it was the it was n not only the work-related stress, but the amount of money that he was dealing with. The, the idea that if I make a bad decision here, or if I do something wrong, I'm going to lose all this, and then the pressure to want to actually uh, pass something down to your children as well. You know, so uh, there's that there's that whole whole side of it um, as well. And then the fact that you know you do have this this. Uh, I think disjuncture sometimes between the experts, and that's why the very end of the title is experts. Um, is this idea of you know the experts have a different point of view, they have a different perspective. The folks at the land grant colleges, and there was there was a lot of I think um, I guess if you have to uh, <laughs> space between a lot of bridges to, to cross, I think uh, that's one of the things that always is is is, is there as well. So hopefully that kind of answers a few of your questions. Great great question by the way. You know, the, that's, that's a great question. It, the thing I've noticed about the whole accident issue and the, the impact that farming has on the, on the human body and in terms of just the stress of the work and, and so forth, you find that scattered in a lot of other books, but not so much a book just specifically devoted to it. Um, and uh, that's, there are books out there that deal with it, but it's kind of hard to find books that uh, deal with it. In the, in the way that I was kind of looking at it, but in a standalone way, looking at it just in terms of accidents. So I, I definitely, um, and I think that's where, you know, you could kind of look at the global ramifications of this, because the industrialization of agriculture, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, we're that these very sophisticated pieces of machinery, this is being exported all over the world, right? And so it definitely has global ramifications. And so I'm sh absolutely certain that in places like West Africa and all over the world, people are facing these various, uh, various kinds of challenges, probably in ways that it would be pretty shocking uh, if we would really think about it, the, the impact of, the, of, of, of those technologies. Um, because, like I said, with, um, a lot of times you have the whole family involved uh, in, in that work, you know, and, and people at very young ages involved in that work as well. So, great, we great question. More? Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Oden, you touched on how uh, there were Safety engineering was more based in the land grant colleges and in the Corn Belt, and uh, less so in the South. So I have a kind of three-part question on that. Do you think that's based on the history of slavery in the South? Uh, also, did that result in more injuries in the South? Were there more accidents because of the, the, the safety engineers weren't there? Well, yeah, that's a great question. Can, can I answer what you're at right there? Sure, yeah, sure. That, yeah. The 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 definitely with the land grant colleges, you think of College Station, obviously, you know, and definitely had agricultural engineers, and you know, definitely had, um, you know, if you think about um, um, experiment stations, you know, and definitely, you know, um, going back to the Progressive Era, this concept that that agricultural engineers bring into the discussion of trying to modernize agriculture, their their idea that they had to bring their expertise to the countryside, and that's kind of one of the gulfs that I was kind of talking about. Uh, that's some of the resentment that you see from the farmers. You know, that's one of the reasons why uh, some of the family farmers um, 
feel as though they're entrepreneurs, and in some ways you see some uh, resistance to the efforts of, of, uh, of safety experts. But in, in regards to the issue of safety, that's a very curious thing that I noticed, uh, at least researching the Midwest, is that uh, I, didn't know, I didn't find the numbers of safety experts in the South when they would have their annual meetings uh, at the National Safety Council, because the National Safety Council was very important in basically serving as a meeting place for these experts. And uh, a lot of the leaders definitely um, were uh, coming out of the Midwest and the Northeast, and I just didn't uh, see a lot of that emphasis, you know, in the South, you know, on, on safety. So absolutely, the industrialization of agriculture, you know, the innovation and the idea of, of, uh, uh, of increasing the productivity of agriculture was there, but um, that, that's, a, that's a curious thing, you know, in terms of just looking at the fact that, um, yeah, you see, you see that in the North, but not so much in the South, and, and maybe that, ha that probably has political, there's probably political reasons uh, for that as well, you know, that you could explore. But uh, that, that would be definitely be a topic I'd love to dive into. I've been looking, I don't know if I should jump into this already, cause it's a, but I've been looking at cotton gins, cotton gins right now, and uh, um, wow, that's a, a fascinating topic uh, in the South, and um, the, 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 the issues related to safety and cotton gins. I hope that, I hope that answers your question, that it's just the, I see less attention to safety in the South so far. But the engineering's there. The engineering's there, yeah. Thank you, too, very much. Thank really you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.